The plan tonight is to cover Psalm 119 in its entirety. So I'm excited about doing this. If you want to go really in depth in Psalm 119, we, we did a, an adult Sunday school class on that. It's on my YouTube channel, so you can look at it in each section. But I think it's good to remind us that Psalm 119 was given as a whole when it was first given. It was looked at as a whole, and so I think it's not only beneficial to look at in sections, but to look at it in a whole. And I'm going to try to keep it as short as we can, but just in case we limited our worship for that purpose. In 2 Timothy 3.16, Paul says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is prof profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Perfect there meaning complete. Thoroughly furnished means move in ready. Right? You don't have to bring anything with you. You just move in. It's like an Airbnb or, or staying at a mountain suite. You just show up. You have everything there that you need. And I believe with all my heart that everything I need is found right here. When Paul wrote his first letter to Timothy, he said, Give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. He says, young man, be reading God's word. Read it, read it, read it, read it. Read it through, and then read it through again, and then read it through again, and read it through again. When he wrote his second letter to Timothy, he said, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If I had one chapter that I could teach for the last time for this congregation, this would be it. If I only had one more opportunity to teach, if I could only leave you with one more thing, this would be it. This is the longest chapter in the Bible. It's the longest psalm in the Bible. And the whole chapter talks about the Bible. One of the most difficult things for me as a pastor is this. Beating the drum of being in the scripture. I have beat that drum louder than anything else, and it has been the less heard of any drum I've ever played. I have beat this drum the loudest from the time I started teaching God's word, telling people, get in the word, have a daily quiet time, develop the discipline, read through the scripture again and again, study the scripture, listen to Bible studies, go to Bible study, meditate on the word, memorize the word. And it never ceases to amaze me how difficult it is to get God's people to do that faithfully. And so I'm hoping if that's you, if you've struggled, I'm hoping that this study will spark something in you that'll help you get motivated to do so. We're going to title this study, The ABCs of the Bible. We were homeschoolers, and when we started teaching our kids, we used these little flashcards. A is for apple. B is for butterfly. C is for caterpillar. We did that, and, and based on that information, they learned how to formulate words, and that led to their ability to communicate. And now we have sweet conversations as a result of that. Well, the Hebrew language is no different. This psalm before us is an acrostic psalm. We've looked at acrostic psalms before. Some are incomplete, some are complete. This is like an acrostic on steroids. Just to remind you, an acrostic psalm is every line within the psalm. It's hard for us to see in the English, but in the Hebrew, every line is the consecutive Hebrew letter of the alphabet. The Hebrew alphabet has 22 letters, and each one of those letters has a meaning. Each one has a numeric value. Each one of them has an ancient pictograph, what it looked like, and it had changed through the years to what it looks like now in, in the writing today that we see. What I want to do is read each one of these sections. We're not going to go verse by verse through it. There's just absolutely no way. But since each eight lines, each section, every line within that section is that consecutive 
letter. Like if it was in our alphabet, it would be A, 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 and then the next would be B, 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 and so forth. That's what it looks like in the Hebrew. Unfortunately, we lose that to a large degree in the English. But I want us to look at that letter and maybe understand that section based on that letter. So there's your introduction. It was even longer than it probably should be. So here we go. Fasten your seat belts. It's going to be fast, but I'm praying it's going to be good. Verses 1 through 8. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with a whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. I will praise thee with uprightness of heart when I shall have learned thy righteous judgments. I will keep thy statutes. Oh, forsake me not utterly. Throughout this psalm, God's word is going to be described by eight general words. You'll see it over testimonies, commandments, statutes, and so forth. But they all really in the big picture point to the same thing, but they have little differences and nuances. We won't go into that today. The first section is the Hebrew letter Aleph. Aleph. It means to learn. And the ancient pictograph is the head of an ox. The letter, the top looks like the horns of an ox. What's interesting about this as it pertains to God's word, we just read three things are repeated over and over again in this section. We see the way, the way, the way. We see his walk, his walk, his walk. And we see keep, keep, keep. We need to be learning God's word. And in Matthew chapter 11, Jesus says this. This is what's interesting about this letter and the pictograph. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn. That's what Aleph means. Learn of me. Learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart. Ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Oxen were teamed up, if you will, with a yoke. And they would always put a stronger, more experienced ox with a younger, less experienced ox. We know who did most of the pulling. And the younger one would learn as he was teamed with the other. One of the reasons we need to be in the word of the Lord is we learn from him, learn of him. We're not just learning information. We're learning from Jesus himself because he is the word made flesh. Second section. <laughs> Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. O oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. With my lips have I declared all the judgments of thy mouth. I have rejoiced in, thy, in the way of thy testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. The second letter is bait. You have Aleph, you have bait. And bait is the picture of a house or a temple, a dwelling. In its preposition form, it carries the idea of in. And we see that in this section. He says, thy word have I hid in, in my heart. He says in verse 10, I, with my whole heart have I sought thee. The idea of the heart being a home, bringing the Lord's word in our heart. Jesus says in John 15, 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, we're told this. Let the words of Christ dwell in your hearts richly by faith. Hiding God's word in our heart. 
putting God's word in our hearts. Jesus said to his disciples that a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. It's important for us to fill our hearts with God's word because that's what's going to come out of our hearts. Amen? Amen? This book will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from this book. Verse 13, he says, with my lips have I declared all the judgments of thy mouth. There are two types of people. There are people who have to say something and there are people who have something to say. And Jesus says what? From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We need to be hiding God's word in our hearts. Third section. Deal bountifully with thy servant that I may live and keep thy word. Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. I am a stranger in the earth. Hide not thy commandments from me. My soul breaketh for the longing that it hath unto thy judgments at all times. Thou hast rebuked the proud that are cursed, which do err from thy commandments. Remove from me reproach and contempt, for I have kept thy testimonies. Princes also did sit and speak against me, but thy servant did meditate in thy statutes. Thy testimonies also are, what are, my, de are my delight and my counselors. The third letter is Gimel. The ancient pictograph is a camel. It literally means to deal or to recompense, to give reward or benefit to someone. The idea is like the rider on a camel being lifted up or like camels in a caravan bringing trade goods from a distance. The psalmist in this section is, is asking the Lord to open his eyes, to hide not his commandments, remove from me. He's asking the Lord to recompense him, but he starts in verse 17 by saying, deal bountifully with me, reward me, benefit me, bless me as a result of being in your word. The writer of Hebrews says, He that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You need to understand that God is going to recompense. No time spent in this book is wasted time. No time spent is wasted time. And God is going to reward us for being in his word. In Psalm 19, verse 11, if you remember, the psalmist is talking about God's word. And he says this, in keeping them, there is great reward. Four times in the scriptures, in the Psalms, the psalmist says, the Lord is dealt bountifully with him. He's recompensed him way beyond what he deserves. If you're looking for a reason to be in God's word, this is a reason. He will reward you for doing so. My life is not the same life it was when I started reading his word at age 15. He has recompensed me. He has blessed me. His benefits have been amazing to me. The next section Verse 25, my soul cleaveth unto the dust. Quicken thou me according to thy word. I have declared my ways and thou heardest me. Teach me thy statutes. Make me to understand the way of thy precepts. So shall I take talk of thy wondrous works. My soul melteth for heaviness. Strengthen thou me according unto thy word. Remove from me the way of lying and grant me the law, thy law graciously. I have chosen the way of truth. Thy judgments have I laid before me. 
I have stuck unto thy testimonies, O Lord. Put me not to shame. I will run the way of thy commandments when thou shalt enlarge my heart. The next letter is Daleth. It means to draw, really, but the pictograph is, is that of a door, the opening to a tent. It carries the idea of, of drawing a door open or being drawn inside. Jesus says in John 10, I am the door. Whoever comes in through me will find pasture. But he doesn't just say, I'm the door. It's through me that you come to the Father. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, he says this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. So there's the door being Christ in which I enter into, I'm drawn into everything the Lord has. But there's another door that's important. It's this door. It's the door of my heart, the door of my life, in which I need to open. And Jesus says, He that loves me and keeps my word, I and the Father will come into him and make our abode with him. Notice he says, Quicken thou me, teach me, make me, strengthen me, grant me. All of these things he's asking the Lord to do, it's through that door. We can't have it any other way. I'm reminded of the Passover where the blood was sprinkled upon the doorpost. This idea of the door is, is important. When we open this book, we need to open our hearts. And we need to understand that it's Christ who then opens up everything God has for us in it. And if we don't know what's in it, we don't know what he has for us. It's imperative that we know God's word. Let's go to the next section. Teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes, and I will keep it unto the end. Give me understanding and I shall keep thy law. Yea, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Make me to go in the path of thy commandments, for therein do I delight. Incline my heart unto thy testimonies and not to covetousness. Turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity and quicken thou me in thy way. Establish thy word unto thy servant, who is devoted to thy fear. Turn away my reproach, which I fear, for thy judgments are good. Behold, I have longed after thy precepts. Quicken me in thy righteousness. The next letter is hey, like hey. <laughs> it, it, it's this picture of a window in the ancient picture, pictograph, it was even as a man holding his hands like this, peering through a window. It means to behold. And notice in this section, he says that I may observe it with my whole heart. He says, turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity. He's like, turn my eyes, Lord, towards you. In James chapter 1, James is talking about being a doer of the word, not just a hearer of the word. And he says this, Whoever looks into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, not being a forgetful hearer, he says, because those who are forgetful hearers are like a man who beholds himself in a glass. He looks in the glass, but he goes his way and forgets what manner of man he was. We are to peer into the word for two reasons. When we peer in, we see Jesus. And when we peer in, we see a reflection, ourselves. When we open up the word and see ourselves, there needs to be a change. But that change doesn't take place by looking at the scripture and looking at myself and going, okay, from now on, I'll do it that way. It doesn't work like that. We've got to look in, see ourselves, and look to the one who can make those changes in us. If you remember from our study in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, 
Paul says, but we all with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into that same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. This is why the enemy fights you with your quiet time. This is why there's thousands of excuses for you not to read the Bible. Because the enemy knows when you open up the scripture, open up your heart, peer in and see Christ, the Holy Spirit changes you. He changes you. Sometimes, I, I haven't even noticed the, cha the changes until months later. Sometimes other people remind me of the change. They say, you know what? I've noticed X, Y, Z. And I'm like, wow, I didn't even know that. That's because I wasn't the one that changed it. He's the one that changed it. In Hebrews chapter 10, in Psalm chapter 40, Jesus says this prophetically. Behold... I come in the volume of the book. I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. We need to look into the window and see Christ in the scriptures. Amen. Next section, verse 41. Let thy mercies come also unto me, O Lord, even thy salvation, according to thy word. So shall I have wherewithal to answer him that reproacheth me, for I trust in thy word. And take not the, the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for I have hoped in thy judgments. So shall I keep thy law continually forever and ever. I will walk at liberty, for I seek thy precepts. I will speak of thy testimonies also before kings and will not be ashamed. I will, I will delight myself in thy commandments, which I have loved. My hands also will I lift up unto thy commandments, which I have loved. I will meditate in thy statutes. The next letter is Vav. It's a hook or a peg or a nail. It's the word used to describe the hooks that held up the curtains that surrounded the tabernacle, that place where God met with his people, which was the very center of everything in their lives. We find the first one in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. The idea of evolve, the meaning is a connection. And it's where we see heaven and earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There's the connection of those two things. And it's God's word that makes that connection for us. It connects heaven and earth together. Now, here's what's interesting. The last time we see the Vav in its use is in Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. This is the generation of the heavens and the earth. And what's interesting in the original language, in the scripture, every time we see that, all the way to Ruth chapter 4, verse 18, the Vav is missing in that phrase. After the fall, the Vav is missing. But it shows back up in Ruth chapter 4, verse 18, where it says, the generation of Perez. Perez means a breakthrough or breaking through. And he is listed there at the end of Ruth, right before going into Samuel. And we're told at the end that Jesse is the father of David. Jesus is a descendant of David. So Christ brings back that missing Vav. He is that breakthrough, reversing the fall. And when we get to the New Testament, we open it up and start reading in Matthew chapter 1. What's the first thing we see? The book of the generation of Jesus Christ. He changes everything. Everything hangs on him. He restores all. Next section. Verse 49. 
we still got a long way to go. So if you're thinking, man, he's going really fast. Well, <laughs> remember the word, the, remember the word unto thy servant upon which thou hast caused me to hope. This is my comfort in my affliction, for thy word hath quickened me. The proud have had me in great, greatly in derision, yet have I not declined from thy law. I remembered thy judgments of old, O Lord, and have, and have comforted myself. Horror hath taken hold upon me because of the wicked that forsake thy law. Thy statutes have been my songs in the house of my pilgrimage. I have remembered thy name, O Lord, in the night, and have kept thy law. This I had because I kept thy precepts. The next word is Zayin. Yeah, wow, that was so good. That was super close, too. Zayin, it, it, it carries the meaning of a hand weapon. A hand weapon, which is interesting when we're discussing the idea of God's word, isn't it? Because in Ephesians chapter 6, what are we told? This is the sword of the Spirit. It's the only offensive weapon we have in the armor that God has given us in our battle, our fight against the enemy. Hebrews chapter 4 says, The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. We have many, many, many Old Testament pictures of what this looks like. When we look in the Old Testament, we should look for pictures of New Testament truths. And in Samuel, in Samuel, we see Eleazar fighting against the Philistines. And the Bible says he takes a sword in his hand and he fights the Philistines for so long that his hand becomes tired, but it is frozen to the sword. He fights and fights and fights and fights until he can't open his hand. It's, it's as if the sword has become an extension of who he is. And that should be a picture of you and I in this battle that we're in. In Judges chapter 3, there's a king called Eglon. He must have ate a lot of eggs. He's the only guy in the Bible that's called fat. He's the only person in all of the Bible that, that the Lord actually calls fat. So if God calls somebody fat, it's probably safe to say they're fat. And he was oppressing the Israelites. And God's spirit moved on a man named Ehud. And he took a two-edged dagger, a sword, and he hid it under his robe. He was left-handed. And so it's, it's the story where lefty kills hefty. He goes to talk to Eglon and he slips into his chamber and the Bible says nobody knew he had it. He pulled that sword out and he drove that sword into Eglon's belly, into his belly, through the layers of flat fat, all the way to where the handle of the sword was buried and his hand inside of Eglon. In the Bible, I love this. The Bible says, and the dirt ran out. His entrails, what he ate, and your imagination, can t it just oozed out. Eglon is a picture of the flesh. We have three enemies, the flesh, the world, and Satan. And it's the sword of the spirit that we need to learn to use against the enemy. In this section, he says, I was in affliction, verse 50. I've been in derision, verse 51. I've been in horror, verse 53. I've been in a pilgr pil pilgrimage, 54. And in night seasons, 55. All of these are pictures of the battles that we go through. But he's got this weapon in his hand that he fights against the enemy with. In Revelation chapter 19, Verse 15, we see Jesus in his second coming to deal the final blow on all of God's enemies. And it was, as it were, a two-edged sword, a flaming sword out of his mouth. We need to learn like him in Matthew 4 to say, it is written. 
It is written. That's all we need to say to the devil is God said. Period. End of discussion. Next section. Verse 57. Thou art my portion, O Lord. I have said that I would keep thy words. I entreated thy favor with my whole heart. Be merciful unto me according to thy word. I thought on my ways and turned my feet unto thy testimonies. I made haste and delayed not to keep thy commandments. The bands of the wicked have robbed me, but I have not forgotten thy law. At midnight, I will rise to give thanks unto thee because of thy righteous judgments. I am a companion of all them that fear thee and of them that keep thy precepts. The earth, O Lord, is full of thy mercy. Teach me thy statutes. Het is the next letter. It's a picture of a fence, a hedge, a pasture, if you will. A lot of people, and I'm afraid to say even believers, they don't read their Bible because they feel like God's trying to, to keep them in, to, to keep something from them. That, well, it's just too narrow. It's too tight of a space. I need some more breathing room. If you remember, the psalmist says, the boundary lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Pleasant places. God hasn't hedged me in to, to hurt me. He's hedged me in to help me. When we get to Psalm 139, we're going to see that the, that the psalmist says, the Lord has hedged me in before and behind. Satan recognized this hedge. In Job chapter 1, God says, have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him. And Satan says, I've thought about him many times. I'm paraphrasing. I've thought about him many times, but, but you have put a hedge about him. What's interesting, though, what's interesting is when we get to Job chapter 3, Job sees the same hedge, but in a different way. He says, the Lord has hedged me in. Job is making a mistake and thinking that the lines were to keep him in. No, the lines were to keep the enemy out and he could only trespass if God gave him permission. But it's God's word that establishes. And we need tonight more than I believe ever boundaries. We need to return to boundaries in our lives, boundaries in our relationships, boundaries in the things that we do. And look what he says. You don't have to turn back. If you have your Bibles, you can. I, I don't want to get this messed up up here. But he says in verse 57, thou art my portion, O Lord. That literally means in the Hebrew, my territory. You're my territory, O Lord. I, I'm going to live within you. The Lord told Joshua, every place you put your foot, I've given it to you. At the end of this psalm, this section of the psalm, the psalmist says, the whole earth is filled with your mercy. The psalmist is realizing, no matter how far I go, I'm finding that line is still there protecting me. I can never outwalk that line. You remember when Abraham split apart from Lot? Lot lifted up his eyes, saw the well-watered plains of Sodom, and he went his way. After that, God said to Abraham, Abraham, lift up your eyes and look to the east, to the north, to the west, to the south. Everywhere you see, I've given it to you. And then the Lord says something interesting. Now, Abraham wasn't Australian, but the Lord says, you need to go on a walkabout. I want you to walk through the length and the breadth of the land. I want you to see what I've given you. Church, we need... Listen, don't, don't, don't misunderstand what I'm going to say. We need to push the boundaries. Not in the negative way that we typically think. You know, pushing the line. Oh, can I do this and still be a Christian? Not that, but push the boundaries. We need to go on a walkabout through the scripture. Lord, what do you have for me? What have you given me? Who am I in Christ? Oh, what does your word say about this? I need to push the boundaries. In Isaiah 54, Isaiah says that we should lengthen our cords Strengthen our cords. We should expand our tents. That's what Jabez said. Expand my territory, Lord. Make it bigger. Let me, let me go where I've not gone before. Every morning should be that way for us. Lord, show me something that I've never seen. Take me further than I've ever been. Amen.
next section. 65, thou hast dealt well with thy servant, O Lord, according unto thy word. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I have believed thy commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. Thou art good and doest good. Teach me thy statutes. The proud have forged a lie against me, but I will keep thy precepts with my whole heart. Their heart is as fat as grease, but I delight in thy law. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. The law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. Tet is the next word. And the ancient pictograph began as a circle with an X in it or a snake, something that is coiled up. It carries the meaning of choice. This is the ninth letter in the Hebrew alphabet. And you and I were around nine months, not exact, but we say it, right? We were around nine months in our mother's womb. And from the time we breathed our first breath, we were confronted with choice. With choice. Everything that God created in that garden was good. He made man and it was very good. And the serpent slithered his way up to Eve and said, God has told you not to eat of this tree, for he knows in the day you eat of it, you will know, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Church, if the Lord wanted us to know evil, he would have put it there. But Proverbs says this, there's a way that seems right unto a man. Right? <laughs> we need to make the right choice. Deuteronomy chapter 30. God gives his people a choice, a test really. He says, behold, I've set before you life and blessings, death and cursings. And God's like, and I'm going to tell you the answer. Choose life. Choose life. All through this psalm, verse 66, teach me good judgment. Verse 68, thou art good and doest good. Verse 71, it is good for me that I had been afflicted. The psalmist even recognized that what was happening in his life, God was using for good, Romans 8, 28. As believers, we need to focus on the good. Do you know we have a choice? We have a choice. The snake wants us to focus on evil. The faults of our family members, the faults of our neighbors, what's going wrong with the world. He wants us to focus on all of that. But we have a choice. We can focus on the goodness of God. Amen? And I believe being in God's word will do that. Being saturated in God's word will help you become a person who sees the good, who sees the good, who sees the good, who sees the good. Oh, yes, there's a flood, but they're safe in the ark. Oh, yes, there's lions in the den, but there's an angel that shuts the mouth. Right? We, we, we have to start seeing the good. Like Joseph, you meant it for evil. But God meant it for good. Next section, 73. Thy hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn thy commandments. They that fear thee will be glad when they see me because I have hoped in thy word. I know, O Lord, thy judgments are right and that thou in faithfulness hast afflicted me. Let I pray thee thy merciful kindness be for my comfort according to thy word unto thy servant. Let thy tender mercies come unto me, that I may live, for thy law is my delight. Let the proud be ashamed, for they dealt perversely with me without cause. But I will meditate in thy precepts. Let those that fear thee turn unto thee, and those that have known thy testimonies. Let my heart be sound in thy statutes, that I be not ashamed. This is the letter Yod. 
The letter Yod, it's got the idea, it's a weird picture up there, but it's got the idea of, of, a, of an arm, a hand with an arm stretched out. And we know from the scripture that the right arm of God is this picture of might and strength. We also know that Jesus is seated where? On the right hand of the Father. And what's interesting about the Yod it is the smallest of all the Hebrew letters. It actually starts with a dot. Therefore, every letter contains a yod. It's at the center of every other letter that there is. It's the starting point of it all. And God's hand is at the center of it all. God's hand is involved in it all. And as we study his word, we start to recognize that. Like the psalmist in verse 73, thy hands have made me his creative hand. Verse 75, he says, in faithfulness you have afflicted me, his corrective hand hand. In verse 76, he says, let I pray thy merciful kindness be my comfort, his comforting hand. Verse 78, he says, let the proud be ashamed, his crushing hand. And then in verse 80, he says, let my heart be sound or complete in the Hebrew, his continuing hand. Philippians 1, 6, he that hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. And Hebrews 1 tells us that he holds all things together. He holds all things together by the word of his power. The yod. Wow. Good stuff, good stuff, good stuff, good stuff. Let's see. Did I, did I turn an extra page? Oh, yeah. I almost did, didn't I? Almost ended really quick. <laughs> Verse 81. Still making good time. Don't worry, I'm watching the clock for you. You don't have to. Let's just focus on the study. He says, My soul fainted for thy salvation, but I hope in thy word. Mine eyes fail for thy word, saying, When wilt thou comfort me? For I am become like a bottle in the smoke, yet do I not forget thy statutes. How many are the days of thy servant? When wilt thou Execute judgment on them that persecute me. The proud have dig pits for me, which are not after thy law. All thy commandments are faithful. They persecute me wrongly. Help thou me. They had almost consumed me upon earth, but I forsook not thy precepts. Quicken me after thy loving kindness, so shall I keep thy testimonies. Cough also carries the idea of a hand, but this is more of the palm of the hand or an etch, a stretched out hand. The idea in the Old Testament of consecration is the filling of the hands. We have nothing to offer the Lord. He fills our hands. He, he fills our hands. We can't receive anything except it comes from the Lord. John the Baptist said that. In James chapter 1, verse 21, James tells us that, that we receive from the Lord and we should receive the word, right? We should receive with meekness the engrafted word. We should, we should be coming before the Lord with our Bibles open and if you will, our hands open to receive of him. As many as believed on him and received him, he gave the right to be the sons of God. We need to be receiving the word, not just reading it. Oftentimes we'll read it. We come to a time like this and we listen or maybe we're, we're tired and we're like, Boy, maybe this wasn't the Wednesday for me to come. He's only, he's only on, what, verse 88, and we're going to 176 and, or 174. We need to have an attitude of receiving. 
Our attitude when we come in the mornings, in our quiet time, in the evening, if that's your time, in your, it should be, Lord, I'm here to receive. My hands are open. I recognize unless you fill these hands, I have nothing. In Isaiah 49, it's interesting. It's not just our hands that are open. All throughout the Bible, God's hand is extended. His hand is extended. His hand, hand is stretched out still, the prophet says, even after their sin. But in Isaiah, Isaiah says of the Lord, the Lord speaking, I have engraven you upon my hand. When the Jews finally see Jesus and accept him, they're going to see his hands and say, where did you get these scars? He's resurrected. He's got a glorified body. But the nail prints are still in his hands. Verse 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Thy, thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Thou hast established the earth and it abideth. They continue this day according to thine ordinances. For all are thy servants. Unless thy law had been my delights, I should have perished in mine affliction. I will never forget thy precepts, for with them thou hast quickened me. I am thine, save me. For I have sought thy precepts. If, if you need a quick, perfect prayer, that's it. I am thine, save me. That works anytime, anywhere. Anyway, verse 95. The wicked have waited for me to destroy me, but I will consider thy testimonies. I have seen an end of all perfection, but thy commandment is exceeding broad. Lamed is the next word. It has the idea of teaching with correction. It's a picture of an ox goad or a shepherd's staff. And, and the psalmist says, your word is settled in heaven for all generations. They continue to this day. His word is established forever. This is the tallest of all the Hebrew letters. It stands out higher than all of the rest. Interesting, really quick side note. I know we don't have time for this, but moms and dads, verse 90 Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. He's talking about God's word. I encourage parents to communicate with their kids. But parents often take a, a worldly approach. And so they try to dress like their kids. And they try to look like their kids. And they try to talk hip with their kids. And they crash and burn and fail miserably. That's not the way. I mean, if you do that, that's your business, right? But, but let me tell you a surefire way to relate to your children. This
is my meditation all the day. Thou through thy commandments hast made me wiser than mine enemies, for they are ever with me. I have